Dripping down science. The naked scientists. Hello, it's Sunday, the tenth of April. Welcome to the Naked Scientists with me, Chris Smith. With me, Dave Ansell. And with me, Kat Arney. It's our question and answer show this week, and as well as finding out how mosquitoes know that it's night time and uh, come and find you, uh, we'll also be hearing whether fish feel G-forces when they're transported in cars, and we'll be focusing on the radiation situation in Japan and what risk that might pose. Kat? Also in the news this week, how the bacteria in your guts can affect your risk of heart disease and how putting flaps on wind turbines might make them more efficient. And in Kitchen Science, I'll be showing you how to defy expectations and hold an inflated balloon in a candle flame without causing it to pop. So, if you have any questions for us, get in touch now. Tweet us at Naked Scientists. You can write on our Facebook page, that's thenakedscientist.com slash Facebook, or drop us an email. Our email address is chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientist with Chris Smith, with Kat Arney and with Dave Ansell. And we begin with a look at some of this week's top science stories. Kat? We all know that what we eat can affect our risk of heart disease and for years health professionals have been giving the message that cutting the amount of fat in your diet could help to cut your risk of heart disease. But it's not clear exactly how a high-fat diet contributes to heart disease risk as it's not a straight relationship between the fat you eat and the fatty compounds that get laid down in your arteries and cause problems. But now a new paper from researchers in the US, published in the journal Nature this week, provides an interesting new angle. They think that it might be the bacteria in your gut that turn fat in your diet into the gloop that clogs your arteries. Gosh, how did they work that out? Well, the scientists led by Zen and Wang started off by taking a relatively new approach, known as metabolomics, to search for molecules in the body that might be implicated in heart disease. And they took blood samples from people who'd suffered a heart attack or a stroke and compared the levels of a range of small molecules in their blood with the levels of the molecules in the blood of healthy people. And intriguingly, they found that people who'd suffered heart disease had much higher levels of three molecules that are all produced in the body by the breakdown of phosphatidylcholine, also known as lecithin, a nutrient that's found in a wide range of foods, but particularly in fatty foods. But we've known that eating a fatty diet is linked to heart disease for a very long time. So how did these scientists tie the role of the bacteria into it? Well, when you eat something containing lecithin, the enzymes in your gut break it down to produce a molecule called choline. Now, choline is very important. A lack of choline in your diet can cause liver disease and muscle damage. But then it gets interesting. Now, choline, in turn, is broken down by bacteria in your gut to produce trimethylamine. Now, this is a chemical that actually stinks of rotten fish. And this This trimethylamine, in turn, gets taken in your bloodstream off to the liver, where it's turned by enzymes into trimethylamine oxide. And it's this chemical that seems to contribute to the formation of the fatty plaques that can clog your arteries and cause heart disease. But again, how do we know that the bacteria in the gut are responsible for producing this? Well, to prove the link for a start between a fatty diet and the levels of this bad chemical trimethylamine oxide, or TMAO, the scientists gave a lecithin-rich diet to mice that were prone to developing heart disease. And they found that, yes, this fatty diet increased the levels of TMAO in the animal's blood and the mice had more of these artery-clogging plaques. And to prove that the gut bacteria were involved, the researchers treated mice with some really strong antibiotics that completely nuked all the bacteria in their gut. And they found that the the trimethylamine oxide, oxide, this bad chemical, was no longer produced. So what what are the implications for people who have heart disease? Do we need to actually nuke out the uh, bacteria then to prevent it? Well, we actually need these bugs in our gut to help us digest our food and keep our guts healthy. So it's not really practical or actually even possible to get rid of them all but if scientists can actually identify exactly which species of bacteria are producing this trimethylamine then it might be possible to specifically get rid of them 
Alternatively, you could look for some good bacteria that could help to control the levels of these bad bacteria that produce the chemicals. And it might actually be possible, for example, to develop drugs that specifically block the enzymes in the liver that then convert the trimethylamine into the really bad chemical, the TMAO. And this research also helps to explain why a fatty diet with lots of lecithin in it might actually contribute to heart disease. Now, interestingly, and here's a twist, choline, which is produced by your body from lecithin, is sometimes taken as a health supplement. So this actually suggests that that's probably not a great idea if you want to be reducing your risk of heart disease. Indeed. It puts a whole new spin on you are what you eat, doesn't it? Thank you, Kat. Dave? Flaps on wind turbines may make wind power more economic. Wind power is becoming more and more popular. But one of the major reasons that it's still very expensive is that the wind is not uniform. On some days the wind blows very slowly, but on others it blows very, very hard, or even worse, provides really vicious gusts. This means you've got to build a wind turbine that can survive the worst gusts, which makes it far heavier than it would have to be for 99% of its normal use. Most turbines can feather or change the angle of their blades in very high winds to avoid damage, but this can be too slow to avoid the damage from a quick gust, so you've got to be very conservative about how you set your turbine blades so you lose a lot of power. So basically you end up with a turbine which is much chunkier, heavier, has therefore more resistance, more manufacturing cost than really it needs to on average. And it's not generating as much electricity. Um, A group from Rezo DTU in um, Denmark is working on a technology which may help in the same way that you can change the amount of lift on an aeroplane wing by using flaps or aerolons when you control the plane. If you add a trailing edge flap onto the wind turbine blade, you can greatly alter the amount of lift it produces and the amount of drag, and therefore the forces on the structure. Apart from the obvious, the big difference between a wind turbine blade and a wing is that an aeroplane is movable and can be regularly maintained, um, whereas a wind turbine is normally in the most inaccessible place possible, and maintenance would completely stop them being economic. So it's very important to make these flaps maintenance-free. So conventional mechanical flaps wouldn't work. So the group is working on flexible rubber or plastic flaps, which can be activated by pumping air or hydraulic fluid into specially designed cavities at the rear of the flap. As the flaps are much lighter than the whole blade, it can be activated far more quickly than this feathering system, so it can adapt to individual gusts um, without a huge use of energy which you need to twist the whole blade. And it should enable wind turbines to be built lighter and therefore cheaper. Have they actually road tested this? I suppose road tested is the right word. But have they actually tested it to prove that it does perform as expected? They've built laboratory models which seem to work as they'd expect and they're now just about to build a real wind turbine with this technology on and see whether it works. Interesting solution, though. Thanks, Dave. Well, also, in a landmark breakthrough this week, Japanese scientists have used stem cells to grow a new retina in a dish. And this could hold the key to one day producing a replacement retina for patients who've been blinded by diseases or eye injuries. And to tell us more about this and how it works, we're joined by University College London researcher Dr Jane Soudan, who wrote a commentary on the work this week. Hello, Jane. Hello, Chris. So Um, do tell us first, Jane, what actually, in a little bit more detail, have these researchers been able to do? In this new study, um, Sasai's lab have shown that it is possible to grow the complex structure of the retina in a cell culture dish. So the retina is the complex layer of neural tissue at the back of the eye, which detects light and transmits visual information to the brain. And what's really impressive about the new study is that the synthetic retina were grown from an embryonic stem cell line. So these are the pluripotent cells which are able to generate all the different cell types in the body. So the starting point in these experiments is a set of identical cells. And what Sasai found was that under certain culture conditions, groups of the cells self-organized and spontaneously formed into a cup shape called the optic cup, which is shaped rather like a brandy glass. And from the inner layer of this cup, the the retina forms. And indeed, it did differentiate in the dish. Why has this not been possible before? What breakthrough have they made so that we have been able to make this occur in a dish where previously scientists have failed? Well, one of the key components that they added, which previously um, was not used, was something called matrigel, which is a component of basement membranes. And so that seems to have been important for helping the cells to form into a layer from which the retina develops. And this process in human life would occur by around the sixth 
week of development. Now, in their study, they used mouse embryonic stem cells. So an important next step will be to see if the same approach can be applied to human embryonic stem cells. And what about uh, informing our understanding of how this structure does develop? Presumably, because you can now make it happen in a dish, you can begin to interrogate it genetically and ask, well, what genes are being turned on in what cells in what order to make this structure form? Absolutely. I think it provides us with a new system to study how the eye develops, and that's important for understanding the situations where it doesn't develop normally. And I think it's also a very important discovery as it indicates that the embryonic stem cells do have instructions Instructions that allow them to self-organize and this will likely apply to other tissues as well as the retina and so maybe we're at the beginning of witnessing more abilities of embryonic stem cells to self-organize. Now you tantalizingly mentioned earlier as did I in the introduction that this might be a step towards being able to grow replacement tissue for people who have eye injuries or eye diseases that cause damage to the retina. Critically, in this paper from Japan, they use embryonic stem cells, but someone who's got an eye disease, obviously they're beyond the embryo stage by then usually. So is there another cell type that we might be able to make this work from in order to do what they've done for the mouse in the dish in a human? Yes, there are human embryonic stem cell lines, and I think the other possible source would be what are called induced pluripotent stem cells where embryonic stem cells are generated from other tissues and so either of those cell sources could potentially be used to um, generate new retinal cells that could be transplanted into the diseased retina in order to provide a, a treatment for retinal diseases involving loss of retinal cells. Do you think if we did get to that stage, if you were to take these newly generated retinal cells, if you were to put them into the diseased eye, that they would have a chance of restoring vision for that recipient? Yes. I mean, there is still a lot of work to be done, but we and others have shown that if you take immature photoreceptor cells and transplant those into the diseased retina, they're able to restore some light sensitivity. Now, in order to take that kind of approach to patients, it's essential to have a source of immature photoreceptors, and it's possible that these kind of synthetic retinae could provide a source of cells that could be suitable for transplantation into patients. And what sorts of diseases would you think would be amenable to being treated like that? So there are many different types of retinal disease that cause um, blindness. A large number involve the death of the photoreceptor cells, so the cells that sense light, and they would include conditions like retinitis pigmentosa and lots of different types of inherited retinal disease which affect around 1 in 3,000 people. So those sorts of conditions um, could be amenable to retinal stem cell therapies. Terrific. Jane, thank you very much for joining us to tell us about the work. That was Dr Jane Souden. She's from University College London. And you can find Motosugu Iraku's paper that we were just discussing there, as well as Jane's accompanying News and Views article in this week's edition of the journal Nature. Now, they say that manners maketh man. Well, it turns out, thanks to some researchers in the Netherlands, that a tidy street can also stop stereotyping. This is something of a surprise finding. Researchers have discovered that chaos and clutter cause people to be far more prejudiced than when things are kept nice and tidy. This is Diderik Staple and Sigvort Lindenberg, who are at um, Tilburg University. And what they did was to take advantage of the fact that there was a strike in the cleaning department at Utrecht Central Railway Station. So they went to the station when it was a complete mess and they did a survey and they asked commuters would you mind filling in our survey about prejudice and discrimination and while you're doing it could you please have a seat on one of these six seats we've put here for you to sit on and what they'd actually done is to sit at one end of this row of six seats another person who was a plant but the person who they planted was either black person or a white person. And unbeknown to the people who were being asked to sit down, what they were doing is covertly watching to see where the person sat who was doing the questionnaire relative to the person who was already seated. And the amazing thing that emerged was that if a white person was sitting 
in the line of seats when the new questionnaire filler sat down. They would sit an average of two seats away from the person who was already seated. If it was a black person sitting there, they would sit an average of three seats away from the person who was already seated, but only if the station was messy, because when the researchers went back a week later and the cleaners were off strike and the place was pristine again, then there was no difference between where the questionnaire fillers sat relative to whether it was a black person or a white person in the seat. And they think, well, we'd better check this out and see whether this is robust. So they then went to a street in an affluent part of a suburb in the Netherlands, and it was a nice, pristine street, and they stopped people in the street and they asked them to fill in a survey about prejudices and discrimination. And they then uh, asked them if they would accept five euros for their trouble of filling in the survey, which they gave them, and then said, uh, would you like to donate some money to this charity, which is for ethnic minorities? And people gave a certain amount of money. They then messed up the street. They parked a car on the pavement with a couple of windows open, knocked out. They put a bicycle like it had been abandoned in the street and they heaved up some of the paving slabs and did the experiment again. And guess what? This time, when the people took their five euros away and they were invited, well, would you like to give a bit of it to this charity? They gave far less. And they've done lots of different experiments um, repeating this, showing various other kinds of examples of chaos or disorder affecting people's effectively prejudices. So it looks like if you are in a messy environment, it makes you become far more discriminating and far more prejudiced than you would be in a tidy environment. And their argument is that in a world in which chaos prevails, people seek to simplify and seek to unclutter. And part of that process is by reversing your mental thought processes back to a very simple set of simplifying rules, which includes discriminating against people because you want to see simplicity, just you and your type knocking around, it would appear. And so they quite nicely say in their paper, and I'm going to quote from the paper it says, which is in Science This Week, signs of disorder such as broken windows, graffiti and scattered litter will not only increase antisocial behaviour, they automatically lead to stereotyping and discrimination. And here's the clincher, so maybe our local councils can all pay attention to this. Thus, investing in repair and renovation and preventing that neighbourhoods fall into disarray could be a relatively inexpensive way to reduce stereotyping and discrimination. What do you think of that? It's fascinating. I wonder if it's related to the way that you tend to get a lot more gang behaviour in sort of really grotty areas because it sort of sounds like it's making people a lot more tribal if, you, if they're feeling uncomfortable about their environment. And so if they've got a really uncomfortable environment, they suddenly become very gang-like and very tribal. I, don't, I think you're probably right. I think people are reverting to type and they seek their own and viewing people of a different race or colour or culture as different to them. And I think it's an intriguing point they make. Tidy the place up, this prejudice goes away, and therefore you can spend a lot less money actually in the long run just tidying the place up than trying to educate people about not discriminating against people. Anyway, tell us about comets. Seems like some comets may have had a watery past. Um, comets are often termed dirty snowballs made up of water and carbon dioxide ice with a few rocky minerals mixed in. Um, they're thought to have formed way out in the cold outer reach of the solar system and they're deflected somehow into the inner solar system by some gravitational effect where the heat of the sun causes the water and carbon dioxide and other volatiles are sublime straight to a gas throwing out lots of material and forming the comet's tail. Because the pressure is so low, liquid water should never have been able to exist in this process. Um, and when you're a long way away, it's just far too cold for it. Up until recently, though, there was no way of proving this. But NASA's Stardust mission has made a close flyby of the comet Wild 2 in 2004. In this flyby, it flew in through the comet's tail and mounted on the spacecraft was a plate made out of the incredibly low-density silica-based material aerogel. This meant that any small dust particles hitting the plate were slowed down gently and trapped. The sample plate was then returned to Earth in 2006, and ever since, NASA scientists have been very carefully studying the grains of cometary material in that collection plate. What's turned up? Well, Eve Berger and colleagues are, are some of those who have been doing this study, and they have found a copper iron sulphide mineral called cubonite in some of the cometary grains. This is interesting because cubonite is only produced in the presence of liquid water, it has two forms, one stable above 210 degrees Celsius, and the one they found, which is only stable below 210 Celsius, and it could only be formed above 50. So they know the grains must have experienced some wet conditions at least 50 degrees centigrade, and they haven't heated up very hot in between. 
So either this cubonite was created somewhere else and got integrated in the comet, so maybe it was created close into the solar system and then thrown out and then formed into the comet. Or possibly even more fascinating, it was actually the comet has somehow heated up and melted partially in the process, either when it came near to the sun, but it shouldn't do because it would need to somehow sustain the pressure, or in some kind of impact. Certainly a mystery, so how are they going to solve it? We have to study some more grains and ideally go and have a look at some other comets and it shows the importance of actually going and looking at things because you'd never have found this out by just sending a robotic probe and looking at the comet from outside. Indeed we wouldn't. Thank you, Dave. Well, if you want to read up anything uh, that we've covered this week, then the references as well as transcripts for each of those news stories are online now at thenakedscientist.com forward slash news and coming up we'll be taking your science questions in particular we're joined by dr ian farnan from cambridge university's department of earth sciences he's helping us this week with our nuclear themed questions because we're taking a special focus this week on the situation in japan and what the implications might be laying the facts bare the naked scientists It's Chris Smith, Kat Arney and Dave Ansell with this week's Naked Scientists and we're answering all your science questions but we're kicking off with a special look at the nuclear situation over in Japan because of the risk potentially posed by the Fukushima nuclear plant. Dr Ian Farnan is here from Cambridge University. He works on this kind of thing. Hello Ian, thank you for joining us. Hello Chris. Just so people understand a little bit about what you do first, could you just give us a a quick round-up on what you work on? My main research is um, on the disposal of nuclear waste. Uh, In particular, I'm just going to head up a a research consortium uh, funded by the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority on disposing of spent nuclear fuel. And so the way that radioactivity leaks from spent nuclear fuel eventually is by its interaction with water. And what's happening in Fukushima is the interaction of water with fresh fuel. When the tsunami struck and it knocked out the backup generators that they had at the plant, which were there to pump water through the core and disabled those generators, what then unfolded? What was the chain of events, if you excuse the sort of radiation-type pun, which then ensued? Well, there was a little bit of extra leeway. So they had some batteries uh, which ran for a little while, for about eight hours, and then they just ran out. Uh, And at that point, they've got no way of pumping the water through the reactor to keep it cool and then so the water that's in the reactor starts to boil and eventually it it comes out into what's called a pressure regulator which is below the reactor in a large pit which is within the containment and can contain an enormous amount of water the dramatic thing that you saw on the tv was the problem that there must have been some interaction with the zircaloy which is clads the fuel which starts to get oxidised at high temperatures, the fuel heated up, and that produced some hydrogen. So there was a mixture of hydrogen gas in this big pit below the reactor. And at some point, the the pressure was getting too high, and the operators realised that in order to preserve the integrity of the of the reactor pressure vessel, they needed to vent that pit. And when they did that, the hydrogen came out obviously encountered some oxygen and there was an explosion. Uh, and that's what you saw on TV. Basically, there's a, there's, there's a sort of weak roof on the top of those buildings uh, with blowout panels, and that just blew out, and you saw the very dramatic events. But subsequent to that, um, what what was the then threat? The fact that you had no way of cooling a nuclear core that was still producing quite a bit of heat. I mean, the figures I saw were that it was still producing heat at the rate of 7 megawatts, just a shutdown nuclear core as it was. Exactly, the... So the Daiichi uh, number one, uh, I think, was about a, a 700 megawatt. So it immediately at shutdown, even though you stopped the, the critical reaction at that point with the rods in, you've still got 5% of the, of the power, and that's the thermal power. So the thermal power of a reactor is three times the electrical power. That's just the efficiency of the generating process. So the thermal power... We would have had something like 2.1 gigawatts, so then you want 5 for 5% of that is still a lot of energy. But after about an hour, that was already down to about 1%. So then you've got a lot of um, you know, exponential cooling, uh, but still a very lot, large amount of energy which you need to dissipate. I mean, this is the point of nuclear power. There's an enormous amount of energy there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> none of us are, and certainly not the Japanese, are in any doubt about the power of nuclear energy. What about um, the fact that they couldn't then restore cooling to it, so they then had to start pumping seawater in. 
what's happening in terms of the products of, of what's in that reactor getting out? Is it still contained or, or are we seeing contamination? I, th- I think almost certainly we know that the, the fuel has been compromised. The cladding has been breached because what we, 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 what's being detected in the, in the atmosphere are iodine and there's been some cesium detected. And almost certainly there would have been other gases like krypton and xenon. When you start when a nuclear fuel, it's mainly uranium dioxide when it starts. When you have fission, you produce an enormous cocktail of fission products. These are elements which have roughly half the mass of uranium each. Some of those elements can be accommodated chemically uh, or are solid uh, within the fuel. Some are gases. So iodine is, is effectively a gas at, at temperatures of operation, xenon, krypton. So those go into the clad of the fuel. Cesium does not incorporate well into the fuel. So that that lies on the grain boundaries of the fuel. So the moment the fuel is breached, that material will start to be released. And that tells us that the the fuel cladding has been breached. Whether it's completely melted together, uh, that's to be seen. And we may not know for maybe four or five years whether whether there's been any sort of large degree of melting or whether we've just got serious compromise of of the fuel clad. Lots of questions coming in for you, Ian. In Second Life, Paradox Olbers says, how does release of, say, radioactive potassium from coal burning compare with fission reactors and how much actually radiation they're spitting out? Um, It's not uh, very much at all. I think the main emission from coal-fired power stations is actually the uranium that's in, in the coal but that, that would be at a very, very low level. I, I'm not sure I can tell you right off the bat, but it, it's something which is very, very insignificant. And Melissa Palin on Facebook, she says, is there a difference in the amount of radiation that's absorbed in the ground and the amount that rises up into the atmosphere? Well, that very much depends on the way that the release happens. You know, so if you look at the Chernobyl uh, in- incident, the radioactive cloud or the explosion took it up 30,000 feet into the atmosphere. Here, the major release is coming f- was coming from a leak in one of these steam separation uh, or pressure regulator devices below the reactor. Well, there's a 20-centimetre crack, and that's going straight out into the sea. So that's going also into the groundwater system around the, the reactor. And what about the threat? I mean, is this a tiny amount of radiation that will just dissipate? Does it break down naturally within a reasonable time frame, therefore the threat is low? What are the implications? Looking at what NISA, which is the Japanese safety authority, Nuclear Safety Authority, has, has released so far for various off-site locations, there were some, very lar- there were some pretty large spikes in uh, sort of like mid-March, the 14th or 15th of March, and then on the 31st of March, there was quite a large spike. But looking at them more recently, they've gone down. So the large off-site spikes were about 24 times the background level. Background level is quite a mild level of radiation. There's one here from Anne Miller who says, well, how can water become radioactive? Is it just the water carrying radioactive particles out of the reactor? Um, And could this therefore technically be filtered out? Yeah, exactly. So that that's the way that the water is, uh, the radi- radioactivity is transported away from the reactor. Is is that small particles and also elements like cesium will actually dissolve in water very readily. So will the iodine, of course, you people are probably familiar with iodine solutions, and so those can can be uh, separated out using iron exchange resins. In fact. You know, when, when people operate power stations, they, they regularly filter the water which is used in the cooling cycles or the, the, you know, the heat transfer cycles with these resins. And then those resins form part of our nuclear waste inventory. The, the problem was that we had to have this large leak, uh, crack, and, and it was going out unregulated. And one of, one of the operations that's going on now is that the, the plant operators are asking the Japanese government for permission to release water from a, from a holding pool and then let some of the more radioactive water into the waste treatment plant. So they want to release this water from the waste treatment plant and let this more radioactive water into that plant so that they can go through all this filter system. Take its place. Uh, Kat, what have you got? Well, yeah, we've got a related question from Teo Gibson, who's in Japan, and he says, how does food become radioactive? He's seen on the news that the Japanese government is setting regulations for the acceptable amounts of radiation in food. How can he protect his son? He's very concerned. Well, I mean, there, there are various ways that food can become radioactive. It, it, it becomes radioactive when you know plants absorb it either through their roots as they, as they grow or animals uh, ingest it and then you eat the animals. You also get fallout. So in the initial blast where they vented the steam, I mean, there would have been uh, some 
dissolved cesium and iodine and some probably some particles of fuel, very small amounts, in those vents. And those would have then come down around about the Fukushima prefecture. Uh, and, and so that's why the Japanese government has banned the, the sale of, of various different vegetables and, and milk within a certain radius of the plant. Cat. And uh, yeah, another question from Teo as well, because um, he, he's I think he just wants to know a little bit more about what we mean when atoms are radioactive. What kind of radiation are we actually talking about? Gamma rays, X-rays? The cesium-137, which is the probably the one that people are most worried about because it has this sort of half-life of about 30 years, that would be a beta emitter. Most of the elements that we're worried about, in fact, are beta emitters, so that, that, that's the problem. The thing that uh, you need to worry about is, is really the half-life. So the iodine, which has been released, has an eight-day half-life. So, so that will mean after about 40 days, say, it will be at 3% of its uh, initial value, and you know, within 10 half-lives, it's down to a thousandth of its initial value. So that, that's something that dissipates very quickly, um, whereas the cesium will, will stay around for a, a lot longer. But there are, as I say, there'll probably be less cesium than there is iodine. I guess um, some of the reason why they're so worried about the iodine is because it has such a short half-life. Um, it's also very, very radioactive because every atom in it, half of the atoms there are going to react in a few days. So a very small amount of iodine is, has an awful lot more radioactivity. Also, doesn't it concentrate in um, your thyroid gland? Yeah. So, so one, one of the things that, one of the big issues at Chernobyl was the fact that the authorities, you know, the Soviet authorities weren't very quick in getting iodine tablets to the, to the population. So if you, if you can saturate your thyroid with iodine, you, you can protect yourself pretty well against uh, absorbing the radioactivity. Iodine. And that, that's been proven on a number of occasions that, that the, these are potassium iodide tablets. You just take them and, and they work. Ian, just to finish off, we've got one from Sean Hoskins who's asking sort of similar to what Leslie in Suffolk has said. Leslie in Suffolk is pointing out about meltdown, lots of heat and water to cool, can we not use that as a steam pump? And Sean Hoskins is sort of asking about spent fuel that needs to be constantly cooled. Um, is it possible to use the heat that the spent fuel produces, not in a nuclear disaster, obviously, but in storage, to then make some electricity or run a backup battery, for example? It's, it's a nice idea in, in principle, one of the problems with this um, boiling water reactor design that, that's used in Japan is the fact that they use the, um, the, the water that's directly passing over the fuel rods to, to go straight into the generator. And the generators become very contaminated. Now, if you, you would have the similar problem, I think, if you started to try and do that, sort of just taking the heat out of the spent fuel. Uh, and I think there's probably not enough heat there to do a double or, or, or a, you know, a primary secondary type heat exchange, it would then become inefficient and, and not worth the trouble. Not worth doing. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's Dr Ian Farnan from Cambridge University's Department of Earth Sciences. If you'd like to ask him a question about the radiation situation in Japan, now is your chance to do it via Twitter at Naked Scientists on Facebook. NakedScientists.com forward slash Facebook will get you there or send us an email, chris at thenakedscientist.com. It's time now for this week's Planet Earth podcast and to investigate the impact of geology on the spread of pollution, scientists in Oxford are studying how water travels underground across a floodplain. But at this time of the year, unfortunately, the research involves getting wet, cold and muddy, as our reporter Richard Hollingham discovered. I'm wading across a water meadow just on the outskirts of Oxford. I can see the spires in the distance behind me. The river is somewhere in front of me, and I'm not quite sure where the meadow stops and the water starts, so I'm going to be quite careful. What we're actually trying to do is take a sample of the groundwater from this little well that you can see in front of you here. Kate Griffiths from the British Geological Survey. In order to get our sample, we need to first pump out the surface water from around them and then we attach a sort of pipe that enables us to make sure that we're only really sampling the groundwater so we're not getting any interference from the surface water. The measuring equipment is all contained in a wheelbarrow but given that there's water everywhere I asked Dan Lapworth how they even found the well sampling points. One of the problems at this site is that they have to be concealed because there are, there are horses that graze this area. So on top of each well we place a piece of metal. So we, have, we effectively have to find them using a metal detector. Once we've found them, we're then able to take a sample, as Kate has described, 
and there's a whole range of different samples that we're taking. Some to look at the water quality, um, the water chemistry, some to look at how old the water is to try and date the water, uh, and some to look at the organic carbon in the water and to get an idea of the different types of organic carbon that are in the water. And there are multiple sites across this meadow? There are. It's a, it's a transect running from one, one side near, near to a landfill across the, the meadow towards the River Thames. So there's a, there's a series of three nests of wells and there are two transects that run across the, the meadow. And Kate, you're looking at what happens to the water as it, as it goes across, the effects of the meadow on that water underground. Yeah, that's right. I mean, floodplains are very active and dynamic environments, so we've got lots of different types of water that we can see some here. There's groundwater under our feet, obviously, and there's a lot of mixing going on in this area. We've got sources of water coming from the river gravels that form the city of Oxford, so that's a sort of urban input coming into the meadow. And then we've also got a lot of interaction with the river itself. So as well as the sort of physical mixing of all those waters we've also got lots of biogeochemical processes associated with that and we sort of expect those to change spatially and also with time so seasonally we'll see changes in the chemistry as water levels rise and fall and we also see the influence of factors such as Dan mentioned this old domestic landfill which is situated to our left there and that has its own chemical signature which we can pick up as we monitor. I noticed in the mud that standing still is a mistake because yes. uh, likely to lose uh, well is it? We just uh, move around a little bit. Okay. Uh, why do this research? What, what are you looking for? The bigger picture really is that these floodplain environments, there's a lot of them across the country and they're under increasing pressure as our urban areas move out towards the floodplains and even onto the floodplains. You can see over there in the distance the houses are virtually onto the floodplain. So we sort of want to try and understand what role the floodplain can have in trying to reduce pollutants coming from these urban areas and getting towards the surface water over there, which is the River Thames. Obviously, this is applicable to lots of other situations in the UK. A lot of our big rivers have lots of urban areas on their floodplains, so the Thames, the Trent and the Mersey, for example. Dan, you've got the pump operating here, yeah. and that's pulling up some of the water, yeah. going into a little beaker. Yeah. It looks pretty clean to me. I mean, fundamentally, is it quite clean water? It's been moving through the groundwater, the rocks beneath us, which are actually sands and gravels, and as it moves through that, it's, a, it's actually being filtered as it moves. So the water you can see is relatively clean compared to the, the lake water that we're standing in, but it still does have um, lots of dissolved constituents in it. I wouldn't perhaps want you wouldn't to drink, drink it, that. no. <laughs> and it's also probably got lots of microbes in it as well. So it's probably not safe to drink, but it looks very clean. Yeah. That was Dan Lapworth and Kate Griffiths from the British Geological Survey talking to Planet Earth podcast presenter Richard Hollingham. And you can download the latest Planet Earth podcast from thenakedscientist.com slash planet earth. Thanks, Kat. It's Chris Smith, Kat Arney and Dave Ansell. In a second, Dave will be showing you how you can do the unthinkable. You can put a balloon in the flame of a candle and it won't go bang. How's he going to do it? Find out in a second. But first, Kat, here's one for you. Rob Anzalotti's got in touch and he says, Do any animals use objects as weapons? There's been much made recently of animals using and making tools. Has anyone ever observed a non-human animal actually making a weapon, though? He's in Cologne in Germany. This is a very interesting one and uh, I've been looking into it a bit and there is some research that was published in 2007 in the journal Current Biology which does describe chimps using spears, these are sticks that they would broken off and sharpened with their teeth and what they were doing is stabbing them, these sticks, into holes in tree trunks where these little bush babies sleep that the chimps can eat. Now the researchers saw them kind of doing this stabbing thing they wondered if they were trying to chase out the bush babies but they actually saw a chimp stab a bush baby, pull it out on the stick and eat it, suggesting that this is actually hunting behaviour and these chimps are in fact using their sticks as weapons. Oh my god Ian <laughs> Farnan here in the studio is, is looking gobsmacked and so much it's an amazing story, thank you. I've got one here from, uh, this is on Twitter it's from Diver D who said, how do mosquitoes know when it's night time? Even if the light's on, they still insist on biting me and biting me. Arr! So how do mosquitoes actually know it's night? Um, well, mosquitoes have a body clock, just like we do. They have a cluster of nerve cells in 
the mosquito nervous system, which use a genetic domino effect to keep time. So one gene turns on, turns another one on, which turns the first one off and turns the third one on and so on. And this changes the behaviour of the nerve cell, which in turn then changes the behaviour of the whole organism. And in fact, this is a, a phenomenon that was first picked up in the 1970s. I've got the paper here, um, Journal of Experimental Biology, the circadian rhythm of flight activity of the mosquito Anopheles gambii, the light response rhythm by D.R. Jones, C.M. Cubbin, D. Marsh from Brunel University. 1972, that paper was published. They found that mosquitoes have a body clock, just like us, and you can jet lag them. So basically, it's their instincts, just like mice and other nocturnal animals use their body clock to wake them up at night to come and find food. It's the best time for Anopheles mosquitoes to come out at night. That's when their body clock wakes them up. But not all mosquitoes are the same. There are some mosquito species that are active during the day, um, but they are not active at night. And I'm thinking of a good example of this would be Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. They're big, hungry mosquitoes. They spread things like dengue. And they're a real pest because even if you use a mosquito net, you can't protect yourself because they bite people lots of times but during the day. So you find it much harder to ward off their attack. Anyway, great question. Thank you very much. It's The Naked Scientist with Chris, with Kat and with Dave and Ben, who are now, I can see them through the glass in the car park in the back of Dave's car. Hello, guys. Hello there. Once again, we've left the comfort of the air-conditioned, comfy studio and we're sitting in the back of a car because we're going to do a kitchen science experiment that involves a flame. This one is just a candle flame, so it's very safe if you want to try it at home. But actually, Dave promises me it's going to be quite dramatic. Dave, what are we doing? Well, we've got this involved candle frames and balloons, so I'll sort of like blowing up a balloon. OK, this is an ordinary balloon. I can see there's no trick to that. That's a perfectly ordinary balloon, now full of Dave's nice, fresh breath. So we have a balloon and a candle. This doesn't <laughs> bode well at all. What are you doing, Dave? Well, if I apply this normal balloon to a candle flame, something quite predictable happens. Ah! We're in a very enclosed space here. <laughs> that was very, very loud. OK, yes, well, that doesn't at all surprise me. You put a balloon in a flame. What did you expect would happen? Well, yeah, essentially um, the rubber is quite well insulated, so when you put it next to a very hot candle flame, um, there's nothing, nowhere for that heat to go, so the rubber gets very, very hot. It gets so hot it fails, and the balloon goes pop. So it doesn't pass the heat around the air inside it or around the rubber itself. It just all concentrates in one little bit. That melts and exactly what we expected to happen has happened. So let's light the candle again and move on. Now, you have more balloons with you, so I guess I'm going to have to put up with more pops. We'll see. <laughs> OK, these other balloons, though, I've slightly cheated. What I've done is I've added some water inside the balloon. You can hear it when I rush it around like that. So now um, there's no water on the outside of the balloon. It's perfectly dry, but on the inside there is water, which means that when I move this balloon down over the candle... Oh, wow. That's really impressive, because I thought I was going to get not only deafened, but also quite wet just then. But you're properly into the flame of the candle. And in fact, it's even gone black on the edge of the balloon from all the soot. But instead of bursting, it, well, it hasn't done anything. There's some kind of magic going on here, surely. <laughs> not so much magic as heat transfer. Because the balloon is full of water, water is right next to the rubber. Water conducts heat very well. It's got a very high heat capacity, which is one of the reasons why it's used to cool nuclear power stations can absorb so much heat. The rubber can't heat up because as soon as it heats up slightly, um, the heat immediately rushes into the water. The water can't be, certainly can't be above 100 degrees centigrade. It will take it for a, lot, a long time to heat up that much. Don't heat it up that much because it is possible it will pop and boiling water everywhere is a bad idea. But basically the heat goes into the water so it keeps the rubber cool and so the rubber doesn't get hot enough to melt so it just sits there perfectly happily for quite a long time. So the water is obviously getting progressively hotter but... Do we get a convection current inside it that sort of keeps the cooler water next to the rubber and means that the hotter water rises away from it? That's right. The, water, the hot water will rise and the cold water will fall downwards and you'll get a bit of convection in there so the heat will get spread around all the water, not just the water in the middle. So you get very good heat conduction throughout the water. So the water will all stay at the same temperature. And as long as the water doesn't boil, at which point you might get bubbles and you'll stop, you'll, you'll get, then the rubber underneath that bubble of steam can heat up very quickly, the balloon can sit there for really quite a long time. So water is clearly a very good coolant. Would this work for anything else, or is it only rubber that is, is the right sort of material for this? Could we, for example, fill, I don't know, a paper cup with water and then put that in the flame and the paper wouldn't ignite? 
Certainly, if the paper is thin enough, I was experimenting with this earlier, um, as long as you, you don't put the flame on the dry paper, which I managed a couple of times and it set fire to the paper. But um, as long as the wet paper can't catch fire. In fact, the reason why wet paper generally can't catch fire is because instead of the heat going into heating up the paper and causing it to get hot enough to ignite and start burning, um, the heat goes into boiling the water and so it can't get over 100 degrees centigrade, can't get nearly hot enough to ignite and so it just sits there. You say the heat goes into boiling the water. Does that mean that actually, if we set this up well enough, probably with something better than a candle, we could actually boil water in a paper bag? You should do, in theory. I have had a go, but I set fire to the um, paper, so... <laughs> OK, so perhaps don't try to boil things at home, but that's all we have for this week. This should be online at thenakedscientist.com slash kitchen science, and I'll hand you back to Chris. Thank you, Ben and Dave, from the back of Dave's car. And this is The Naked Scientist with Chris, with Kat, and with Dave. We're answering your science questions this week, live on The Naked Scientist. Dave has hot-footed back in from the car park. That was pretty quick, Dave, and it was, it was very good, too. We were very impressed. We were watching you through the glass. I have for you David Hudson, who is in Seattle, and he has a space-inspired question. Hello, David. Hello. Go ahead. Well, from all the articles I've read based on the Earth's outer atmosphere, some bacteria has gotten through to complicate our lives, and yet we're aware that our articles falling or even speeding at thousands of miles per hour are affected enough to burn up. How does this actually occur? Okay, but the main reason why um, things heat up um, when they hit the Earth's um, atmosphere, is they've got a huge amount of en kinetic energy. They're going incredibly fast. When they bash into the Earth's atmosphere, most of the heating is actually because the air they bash into hasn't got time to get out of the way, so the air gets compressed. And when you compress air, you may have noticed that if you've ever pumped up a bicycle tyre very, very quickly, it gets hotter. So the air in front of the asteroid or whatever heats up very, very in incredibly hot. Then that starts to erode the surface of the meteorite, um, and you get this tail of very, very very hot stuff behind the meteorite, which you see as a shooting star. Um, very, very small things, um, essentially, the, because the friction is so much larger compared to their mass, they tend to lose their speed very high up in the atmosphere much more gently, so they slow down much more gently, they don't get as hot. And once they've slowed down enough, they just drift down like dust does gently through the atmosphere. So it is conceivable that something like a bacteria on a small dust grain could survive, whereas a big lump would melt up very quickly. Terrific. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Ilko is in the Netherlands. Hello, Ilko. Hi there. Go ahead. Well, uh, I've got a question uh, in regard to uh, air containing cavities in the body. Probably heard about deep sea diving with suits in which the divers breathe fluids. Uh, the movie The Abyss portrays it wonderfully. The diver is put into a diving suit which is filled with an oxygen rich fluid that he can breathe. And after some disorientation, the diver starts to breathe the fluid and can dive up to hundreds or thousands of meters. Still, one thing puzzles me. There's more than just air in the lungs. What about all the air in the eustachian tubes in your ears? And what about the gases in your bowels or stomachs? Won't they, will they dissolve, or what happens to those? Yeah, indeed. It is a, a very good film, and it does seem way futuristic, but it is actually partly reality. These chemicals, these liquids, do exist. They're called perfluorocarbons. Um, they are, or they include... Um, fluorohexane, for example, so a string of six to eight carbon atoms with lots of fluorines hanging off the side. And they're very good at dissolving oxygen. So one way of doing this would be to instill these fluids into the respiratory tract and you saturate them with oxygen and then you move the fluid in and out in the same way that you would when you were breathing. And why this is helpful is that when a person descends underwater, the pressure they feel from the surrounding water goes up and up and up the deeper they go. So you have to therefore put the gas into the lungs to keep the lungs inflated at progressively higher and higher pressures. And one consequence of this is that it drives other gases like nitrogen and things into the tissues at extremely high pressures, which means that then when you decompress, those gases come out of solution in the tissues and form bubbles, which can cause the bends, they can cause damage to the brain, they can cause damage to bones and muscles and so on. So if you use a fluid in the lung, because fluids are incompressible, then you wouldn't have the same problem because the fluid would withstand the pressure being applied by the outside water much better. The issue with these fluids, though, is that they're not very good at removing CO2. 
They're very good at putting oxygen in. They're not very good at getting carbon dioxide out. And to compensate for the fact that they don't move CO2 very well, you'd have to move a lot of the fluid a lot of the time. And that's one of the major hold-ups with doing this. In terms of the uh, liquid getting into other body cavities and body parts, this isn't such a problem, actually. Um, The eustachian tubes that you mentioned, they run between the back of the throat and the ear, so they would just fill up with the fluid anyway. And the other body cavities, well, they wouldn't actually be exposed to the fluid directly because it would be in the respiratory tree, so there wouldn't be a problem there. And you would just, if there were any leakages of the fluid into other places, you would just pass it, I would think. It certainly wouldn't become part of the systemic circulation, so it should be okay. I make it sound like it's all easy and a problem that's been solved. It is being used in a limited way, but it's certainly not mainstream yet by any stretch of the imagination. Dave, love this one. Can you have a go at this for us? Paul Manklo says, when fish are transported in cars, do they experience G-forces? What do you think? It's a great question. Um, G-forces are essentially centrifugal forces. Um, when you go around a corner in a car, a uh, centrifugal force is there because if you um, your natural tendency, because you have mass, is going in a straight line to make you go in a corner, you've got to apply a force, and you feel that force a bit like gravity is pointing in a different direction. Fish will certainly feel the same centrifugal forces, but will yeah, just it for clarity them? here, he does mean a fish in a in a bowl of water. I think in <laughs> yeah. in a car. Or okay, yeah, a fish lying a, a lying dead in the car will won't notice that will will feel exactly what you feel in a bowl of water. The fish will feel the same centrifugal forces, but they are surrounded by water, and a fish has got a slip swim back bladder, which it autom- automatically adjusts so it is neutrally buoyant. So um, it, as it goes around the corner, um, the water also feels the same centrifugal forces, so the upthrust will increase exactly the same amount as the fish's weight will increase, so the fish shouldn't notice anything at all apart from a slight change in pressure. So the fish shouldn't be flung out towards the side of its bowl then if you were, say, going around a corner? Um, the water might be, but if the bowl was completely full of water, then the fish wouldn't be known. Still bob around in the middle. If you have a helium balloon, it will actually move in the opposite direction because it's less dense than air, so the air gets thrown out and the helium gets pushed in the other direction. Terrific. Thank you, Dave. And actually, we did that as a kitchen science. So if you go to nakedscientist.com forward slash kitchen science, you'll find that um, Dave did do the experiment starting and stopping with a helium balloon bobbing around inside his car. And it's very, very striking. You put your foot on the brake, expect it to go cannoning to the front, and it doesn't. OK, here's one for you, Kat. Uh, Brent says, are animals, specifically dogs, ticklish? Sad news is they're probably not. Um, Some people do say, and and certainly I know this from my parents' dogs, if you scratch them in a particular spot, like behind their ears or on their tummy, their back leg starts moving like crazy. Um, Sadly, this isn't actually tickling. It's probably a scratching reflex that they have that that helps them to scratch away fleas. So uh, the research that I've found at the moment suggests that they don't actually, they're not actually ticklish. Sorry. Because horses do that too, don't they? If you, if you actually touch a horse in the wrong place when you're sort of doing up the saddle, then um, touch their withers and things, and they get terribly upset and they bite you or kick you. Yeah, it's a reflex. <laughs> Let's hope so. They're not just vindictive. OK, <laughs> Dave. We've got a question here from Leah Svilans, um, who says, why do electromagnetic pulses from things like nuclear bombs um, interfere with electrical appliances but not electrical impulses in humans? Um, I can do the first bit. Um, electromagnetic pulse is essentially a very, very rapidly changing um, electric and magnetic field. That very rapidly changing magnetic field will induce very large voltages in anything metallic, anything conductive. Those large um, voltages will use very large currents to flow or sparking, and it will essentially just fry electronics. But Chris, why doesn't this happen in humans? I can only guess that it's a question of the resistivity of the tissue because you can actually induce activity in the nervous system electromagnetically. We know that because if you take, say, someone who uh, does research using transcranial magnetic stimulation, what that involves is putting a very powerful magnetic field over the head and you can alter the activity of whole populations of nerve cells because the nerves behave a bit like miniature wires. If you put those wires in a changing magnetic field, you can change the activity of the nerve cell that's connected to them. So we know that the nervous system is sensitive to things like a big magnetic field. I can only think, though, that in this setting, it's because the human brain does not contain physical lumps of metal and therefore there's not enough of a surge of current or big enough voltage produced to do the kind of damage that you would do to a gadget or a computer or any other piece of electrical equipment that would be exposed under those circumstances and basically blow up. 
Right, well, here's one for you, Kat. Uh, talking about blowing up. Uh, <laughs> can you have two pairs of twins in one pregnancy, wonders Jacob Mann. If females can produce two egg cells at times, then two sperm cells can create fraternal split twins. So could they split into two pairs of the same fraternal twins? What do you think? Um, this is possible, yes. Quadruplets, that's a pregnancy with four babies, can happen in lots of different ways. So you could get four different eggs fertilised. One egg might split into four. Um, that would result in four identical quads. You could get one egg splitting into three, one egg being fertilised, two fertilised eggs splitting into two, all sorts of variations on this. Now, I can find two cases of double twins um, that, have, that I found out about. There's a set of quads made up of two pairs of girls. Um, so that's two fraternal pairs of identical girls uh, born in the UK in 2010 and a pair of identical boys and a pair of identical girls born in Canada in 2008. Uh, both of these resulted from IVF treatment where the woman was implanted with two fertilised embryos and then these both split into two creating two pairs of twins. Now this is an extremely rare situation and just natural quadruplet pregnancies are, are extremely rare so it is possible that it could happen naturally but it would be a very unlikely occurrence. Well, that's good, because as a parent, I can tell you, I think one at a time is hard enough to deal with as it is without having four of them. Uh, Dave, um, two sort of glass-related questions. Tim Harvey wonders, why does light speed up again when it leaves glass? And Mr Banu wonders, uh, why does glass allow light to pass through it in the first place? What do you think? Well, I mean, the main reason, I guess the easiest way to say the reason why glass lets light through it is it just can't absorb the light. Um, the, it's a smooth surface, so light can get into it. And it just doesn't happen to have any electrons which are able to absorb light of, the, of visible frequencies um, in there. So it can't absorb. So the light carries on going as if nothing had, had happened to it. The only effect that it does have is that the electrons in the glass do slow the light down a bit. Um, it doesn't take any energy away from it. All it does is slow it down um, because essentially it's moving through a kind of denser medium, a medium with kind of more inertia to it. So once it leaves the glass again, it moves into um, the air or a vacuum, which is again a less dense medium, at which point the light still got all the energy it had before and it can carry on um, at its original speed. Thank you, Dave. And Kat, to finish off, uh, Aaron Blackman is wondering, and he obviously has a binge in mind, why does overeating chocolate make you feel ugh, sick? Uh, yes. Now, this is probably down to the sugar, and uh, I've conducted lots of experiments in this area. Uh, you may notice that you feel sick after overindulging on any kind of very sweet food, whether it's chocolate or cakes or sweets. Um, not very good for you, but tremendous fun. Um, and this gives your body a massive hit of sugar all in one go. It raises the level of sugar in your bloodstream and causes something known as hyperglycemia. Now, it's this state of being hyperglycemic that makes you feel sick. Now, in most people, this just sends our pancreas into overdrive. We produce loads of insulin. Our cells of our body take up this excess sugar. Everything returns to normal, apart from maybe wanting to stay off the cake for a bit. But actually, in people who have diabetes, this doesn't happen properly. Um, either they don't produce enough insulin or their cells don't respond to the insulin properly and take up the sugar. And in fact, one of the symptoms of undiagnosed diabetes is feeling sick because you can't can't actually control this blood sugar and you do suffer from hyperglycemia. So yes, overeating chocolate will make you feel sick, but if you feel sick all the time after eating, you should probably go and get that checked out. Thank you, Kat. And uh, lastly, Dave, Phil Arbez says, uh, Hello, Chris, really like the show. My question, when I look closely in the mirror, I notice that my reflection has a transparent reflection surrounding my own. What is this new reflection? probably means that you're using a standard back silvered mirror so a normal mirror is made up of a sheet of glass and then they've kind of evaporated aluminium onto the back of it um, which is shiny so the main reflection you see is from the layer of aluminium at the back of the mirror but the front of a sheet of glass also has a weak reflection if you look at any window especially if it's darker on the other side you'll see a reflection of yourself in that um, and so there'll be a second reflection there because of the thickness of the glass. It won't be in exactly the same place. So you've got two reflections, one the main one from the silvering at the back and a front one from the sheet of glass at the front. I think the other place where you see this manifest is if you have one of those car rearview mirrors that you can flick down for stopping the person who's got very bright headlights behind from dazzling you at night time. You flick the mirror down and bizarrely, although the mirror is now pointing downwards and out of your line of view, you can still see a sort of impression of the headlights of the car behind in that and that will be that reflection off of the glass surface rather than the silver one. Yeah, they actually put a second um, piece of glass at a different angle so then you're seeing the reflection in the glass, not in the mirror itself. 
Terrific. Thank you, Dave. Kat, over to you with our question of the week. Yes. Now, a question I'm very interested in. It's time to join a slightly tired-looking Diana O'Carroll for our question of the week. This week, I've been up all night trying to solve this problem. This is Eduardo from the beautiful Shenandoah Valley in the United States. And my question is, why does a lack of sleep cause dark circles under the eyes? I have dark circles under my eyes pretty much permanently, which people are always pointing out to me as if I didn't know it. Apart from forgetting to remove your mascara, what else gives you panda eyes? This is Dr. Stephen Juan, anthropologist at the University of Sydney. Baggy eyes and dark rings under the eyes. Well, they are caused by the same cause. They are the result of body fluid problems that appear as darkness or as puffiness. Now, first of all, the bags may occur when fluid accumulates in the area under the eyes. And this is where the skin is thinner than anywhere else on the body. And with advancing age, and perhaps with the assistance of hereditary factors, the puffiness may become more prominent or even permanent. This is because the skin gradually loses its elasticity and may begin to sag, and gravity doesn't help this either. Now, what appears as dark or blue-black tint, you know, the circles around the eyes, is actually blood passing through the veins, which are located just below the surface of the skin. Again, the skin is very thin. Furthermore, these circles may be darker when the eyes are tired, and dark circles under the eyes often occur in women during menstruation or during pregnancy. There are other factors, too, besides age in this specific hereditary conditions, reactions to cortisone, allergic reactions to cosmetics, tobacco smoke, and air pollution. All of these can aggravate the situation, causing either bagginess or dark circles under the eyes. Sleeping on the stomach can also cause both baggy eyes and, and dark circles under the eyes because, again, of gravity. And that's my answer. Blood vessels getting bigger around your eyes can make the skin there look darker. And we think that when someone becomes more tired, their body is forced to produce more cortisol to keep them awake. And when this happens, the blood volume in the body increases, and then you get blood vessels enlarging to cope with the extra volume. And the smaller veins under one's eye are likely to change more visibly under the thin layer of skin than larger ones under thick skin. On the forum, Karen W said that low iron gave her eye circles and Louise emailed in to say that visible veins below delicate skin could be the answer. Next week and on another anatomical theme. My name is Anita from Surrey. Given the length of a giraffe's neck, does it have trouble throwing up? Does having a long neck make heaving, disgorging, gagging and regurgitation more difficult? Answers to chris at thenakedscientists.com or write on the forum at thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum. You can Facebook us or you can Twitter at Naked Scientists. That is an absolutely blindingly brilliant question. Uh, Thank you, Diana. If you've got any ideas how giraffes vomit, do get in touch. Drop us an email. Thank you. And now you know why Dolly Parton hasn't got any bags under her eyes either. Thank you to Ian Farnan, to our production team, Tom Simpkins, Diana Carol, Ben Vowsler. Next week we are talking gene therapy. Remember the boy in a bubble? Well, we'll talk to the people who are developing a system using viruses to rescue people who have that kind of genetic problem. Join us next week if you can. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com.